Support the Amigos podcast on Patreon or PayPal and receive cool perks and rad swag. Visit our page at everythingamiga.com slash support. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be playing a little game called Lords of Chaos. It's a cool name. That's our nickname, Boat. That is our nickname. If you it's saw also... our pre-show, that's, that, should be our, that should be the name of the show. When you play D&D, are you often a chaotic character? Every time, almost, Boat. Yeah. Chaotic. You're not one of these guys that's always chaotic neutral, are you? Chaotic oh neutral? Oh, my gosh. It's my favorite alignment. How textbook can you get? Although true neutral... Is also a, a, the, in the old days. That's the way I used to go with two true tr- neutral. Is where it's that's at. hard. True neutral is real tough to play. Yeah, yeah. But, that's why nobody does it. Chaotic neutral is the easiest thing because you just do what you want. Well, yeah. I mean, pretty. It's it's one step. From, first of all, when I think of somebody that plays like a, a lawful, is less a lawful evil. Any lawful alignments, I think they're kind of uh, you know wussies. Mm. You know, and then. Anyone that plays like good, like I like another my another one of my favorite alignments, chaotic good. Like you're pretty good. I figure like if I was an alignment in real life, it would probably be chaotic good. I no, would you would be lawful good all day long. No way. No way. Because I do a lot of you know, I'm shifty. I do a lot of stuff to get by, you know. But uh 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 what what about what do you think your alignment would be? Oh, I'm straight up paladin, man. Th- that's not an alignment, that's a class. Well it's you know, what it's the you know the the guy that is uh well you know lawful good i guess is is paladin because he's good and he also no no he wouldn't be lawful because he would do he would do the good thing no matter what the law was so i guess it would be that's I, lawful good is it lawful good okay yeah. I gotta be honest with you Aaron i'm not You're i'm not, not real good at this good, stuff by the way you know i'm not buying that cuz i've seen you i've seen the evil side you know what I'm saying? So how about lawful neutral? I would say or or neutral good. I feel oh, like I feel like I, I would I would probably do best. What was the captain when we played, Aaron? Well, that wasn't D D, but th- that he was the embodiment of chaotic neutral. Just out of his mind. <laughs> um, I, I always think it would be fun to play a character where sort of a paladin like character where you, you always chose the good, no matter what evil it brought upon your party, just because it's so different than my personality, where I just I do what I want all the time. You know, I played a paladin for a long time. Trelana, I believe, was her name, and she was lawful good. The problem with playing a paladin is, is that you have to be good all the time. Yeah, because right. If you're not, like your god punishes you exactly, you, or you can lose your you can lose your paladinship, and that's what happened to me. There was this character in the party that kept poking me and poking me, and the, and the DM knew what he was doing. Mm-hmm. And finally, I cut this sucker in twain, and that was it. That was so I went from being a paladin to a fighter, and you lose all your paladin stuff at that mm-hmm. point. It was brutal. Mm-hmm. That character got shelved soon thereafter. We got to do some uh, Amigos Discord D and D one day, Aaron. I'd love that. <laughs> Well, hey, I'm always good to go on that. I, I, anytime you want to set it up, hey, that'd be great for Zoom. You could set that up pretty well on there. You could probably play pretty good on that. Aaron, it's been a big week here at our uh, our humble abode, everythingamiga.com. We have a uh, a new story that has popped up just today from our that's newest. A, that's a big week right there. Our newest <laughs> writer. Uh, yes, sir. We welcome Rob Flack O'Hara to our editorial board. And uh, his first article for everythingamiga.com is something he likes to call Amiga Memories Part 1. Uh, I will not uh, run down the whole story for you, but uh, if you know Rob, he has he's, he's spent his whole life within the, within the purview of a computer, almost. Uh, he was one of the early adopters, much like yourself, Aaron. And um, this is a story of his first exposure to the Amiga as related to his parents' computer store in the town of Yukon, Oklahoma. Aaron, it's impossible for me to believe now that a uh, a husband and wife team would would think about opening up just like a mom and pop electronics shop. 
Um, yeah. You know, even then, as the as the story relates, uh, it wasn't long for this world. But in a day like today, it's hard to think of a worse business model than uh, than a uh, sort of a uh, locally owned electronic shop. You know, it's I hadn't thought about it until you just mentioned it. But you're, and that's a sad thing. It is a sad right? thing. We live and me and my partner at work one time talked about the good and bad points. I think we've talked about this a little bit of having a modern cell phone, right? A smartphone and you get so much, but what you lose is you effectively your privacy. Uh, and you, so you're giving something up for convenience. Effectively. And this is sort of what's happened to the mom and pop, uh, shops in general, especially something that's technology driven. It's, it's awesome. Heck, I just got on Amazon today and ordered two or three things and it's a bang bang operation. They've got ship. They've cut down the ship into a couple of days. You get it. You're good to go. The prices are as low as they're going to get generally, uh, and it's almost impossible for a, a brick and mortar store of any size to compete with that. Right. Uh, just because there's, it's. I've got access to unlimited everything on a on a on a place like Amazon or even an eBay or a Walmart, whereas you've got a limited everything in a store and if, and if you have to order something for the person that comes into your store then effectively you're no better than amazon exactly so you so it's difficult it's a difficult thing to go through uh i believe in rob's case uh, a bigger cheaper store came to town right? yeah they're called walmart they opened yeah. up and they started selling computer stuff and you're, you're not going to undercut walmart we know that it's, we know that for a fact you know and you're not much younger than me when it comes to, I mean, you remember a time where you could walk down the street and you could go to different shops that had different stuff. Yeah. And that's how you bought stuff. And I'm not saying, listen, I love getting anything I want all the time. Don't get me wrong. But there is something lost, particularly when you go to a store and chat with the owner or get some help or you guys are just strike up a friendship or you're a frequent visitor to the store. And there aren't too many businesses that are still like that. Now, there are a few, and it's funny, the one that comes to mind is the uh, uh, is like your local game st- shop or comic book shop or hobby store, your board game store. Those those things have weathered the storm a little bit better. They still, ha- they still have to weather the storm of just not being successful, but they, that kind of thing, people still... Yeah, because they, you know, they, they offer... They offer more than just your typical retail experience. They offer a place where you can gather and you can play games. And that that means a lot. And that's what any store that wants to open these days has to do. We were talking last week about gateway, the Gateway Country stores and the Apple store. And the difference between the two is that from the get-go, you know, when I worked at Apple, a big part of my job was teaching classes in the store on how to use all this stuff. And uh, it's the same thing if you have a, a, a local game store that, that has, you know, on Fridays we play D&D and on Thursdays it's Mech Warrior, And, yeah. you know, you can make up a lot of rent money by selling chips and pop and stuff like that. And every once in a while, you know, encouraging the people to, to buy from your shop instead of buying on Amazon. Yeah, and I think there's, if you work the right angles, certain stores like that could work. Or like an antique store, you know, stuff, specialty stores. But the days of a st- like a shop like Rob's parents had, where they sold computers, they sold peripherals, they sold software, productivity software. Because I think those days are over. Mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, because for one thing, who's who's selling physical copies of stuff anymore? You know, and and in the uh, uh, in the pantheon of computers, what are you selling, and what are you going to make money off of? The profit margins would be razor thin. It's just not something you're going to see that much. I'm not saying they don't exist anywhere, but they don't exist around here, do they? I mean, there's no place that sells just computers. No, uh, no. And I worked for a place that did that, and I, I, was, I think they're gone, and I think our competition's gone as well. So I always wonder, because there are still a couple of computer repair shops left. Yeah. There's one in Milton, and there's also one in South Charleston near Spring Hill. And I wonder who's taking their computers to these places, you know? Well, I can tell you, uh, here's an inside. You want some inside information, boat? Because uh, I was at the computer store for t- for you know eight years, mm-hmm. and, and until six years ago, I still worked there. And at I, we could see the rag on the wall because the we would charge my services for me to work on your computer, your desktop computer. It was sixty bucks an hour. Mm-hmm. That's not counting parts. And for me to work on any laptop, it was ninety bucks an hour. That's what he charged, right? Uh, and you saw a hundred percent of that, right? I saw zero percent of that. Well, I got my I got my pittance. You know, mm-hmm. occasionally he'd throw a piece of coal in the fire, but uh, uh, what? So what does that mean? And we almost always worked on your computer for two hours at bare minimum. Right. So at the bare minimum, you're in for 120 bucks on a desktop, or 100, almost 200 bucks on a laptop. Well, 
how much does a desktop cost? Cheap. For, for most of the yokels around here, you could hook, you could sell them a TI-99, and they wouldn't know the difference. Right. You know, so they're, they're not going to pay a ton of money to get your, uh, you know, the one thing that we did most of was, like, data recovery and stuff. That's where you could really get them because they were desperate for their stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it is a dirty business. I mean, the way I didn't like being in that business because I thought I knew I was like, man, we're we're fleecing these people. But even my boss, who a former used car salesman, he knew, and because so you know, he shifted as the day is long. He knew that the that the time was drawing near where we're going to shut this sucker down because it was stuff brand new stuff was too cheap and people were becoming. Uh, more well versed on computers and how what they cost and what what you could do with them, and so the age of like fleecing granny for a grand is you know was coming to an end even for him. Yeah, so, yeah, kind of sucked. I'm kind of part of me is happy that that part's gone, uh, but you know your Comp USA's, your Circuit Cities, uh, all those places that were you know I mean there's still some places not around here, not around price here, and stuff yeah. like that still around. But you know we don't have any place that's all gone. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a bummer. Well, I'll tell you what's not a bummer, Aaron. What's been going on on our YouTube site this week? Oh, man. Oh, boy. Let's flip over there, shall we? So uh, let's kick it off this week. I did a little live stream last week. I'm back in the game, boat. just when they thought I was out. Uh, I fired up the uh, PC last week, and we took a little tour of the new version of CoinOps Next, CoinOps Next 2, which is a front end for emulation uh, for the PC. Uh, it's from a guy named Brittany Pears uh, and his team. Uh, uh, he's a quite a genius, Brittany, and he has uh, put together quite a package here in CoinOps Next 2. Uh, this thing comes out, the, the new way he's doing stuff is basically, the, it comes out bare, and then you could add official packs to it to uh, for whatever machines you want. Uh, and so uh, I played just tr I just kicked the tires on this thing last week. We had a good time. I like your but, uh, your dual camera setup. That's very Amiga Bill esque of you to have that. Well, that, you know, the, the, the you, rear. You know how cam. that came about, Boat? I'll tell you. I had a security, a wireless security camera in the arcade, right? Mm -hmm. And I brought it in here, and I, I was like, I wonder if I could access this little web page. And you could. And I was like, hey, I wonder if I could put that in OBS. And I could. And so I just did. That was <laughs> That's great, man. I love so it. If anyone wants to see my back as I play these games, you're in business. It's your best side. That's right, buddy. So anyway, uh, I think I'm going to do the sequel to this tonight with the rest of the stuff I added this week. So if you stick around for later. I like how this is geotagged, too. Hurricane. Yeah, I, I geotag everything I've ever done. People need to know that this fine, fine program is coming from the heart of West Virginia. That's right. Mode. That's right. Speaking of the heart of West Virginia, that's the Brent. He's the heart and soul of the state, boat. And me and him got together, and this was quite a show. I just, I've got to say, I'm not saying it's a good show, but it was something. We took a look at the NASCOM one and two kit computers last week on ARG Presents. Uh, these were computers that came out in the 70s that you soldered together yourself. Uh, and they were, I think they were 300 pounds. Uh, these things, to put one of these together, Boat, it was it was uh, 3,000 solder joints. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, if you can believe that. Um, this was another one of the patented. Brent puts it on the wheel without actually doing any research in it. But and we, it, it took, we were up to the 11th hour trying to figure out how to play games. And we finally figured it out. There were 42 games released for this thing, if you can believe that. And this ended up being a pretty capable machine, Boat, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I'd say it falls somewhere uh, it's just south of the uh, uh, of the of the TRS-80 Model 1s, you know, in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it, boy, this was a lot of fun. We played four games on here, we, the four week, the, you know, four different games we, we had access to. And we had a good time. We learned a lot. And again, a Brit this is a British computer uh, boat. And this was they they brought this over specifically because the people at the North American uh, Semiconductor uh, outfit that's what NASCO is. The North American Semiconductor, by the way, based in Britain, but so much like U.S. Gold. Uh, they saw that all these user groups were popping up in the U.S. And they wanted to break. They wanted to get on the basement of that in the U.K. And so that's why they brought the NASCOM out. So. An interesting story, if you're into that sort of thing. It's we funny, Aaron, because until the Windows 95 era, uh, I had never really played any games on the PC that were much more advanced to this. So in my yeah. mind, PC gaming, including the Amiga, you know, anything on a computer was was sort of at this level that wasn't um, that wasn't I guess the Atari I did, of course I didn't know what the Amiga was but it, definitely any sort of DOS gaming because when I was yeah. a kid I went over to somebody's house and they had a game that looked just like this on their computer and I was like yeah. well I guess this is what PC gaming is 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, that's what PC gaming. You got to th think about this for a second, though, Boat, and think that this would be gratifying. Uh, and by the way, this one looks a lot better here. Uh, this is your scramble clone. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, think of how gratifying it would be to buy these parts, solder them in, hook them up with via UHF to your TV, and then it come on, and you have built yourself a computer. Sure, you know? sure. In, in, in 78, 79, this would have been a, I mean, it would have been uh, uh would have blown your mind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, I'll tell so, you what, you wouldn't have got rid of it at the, at the first sign of upgrading like we do with computers today. If you put this thing together, you, you would never let it go. You'd probably still be using it today. You know, the funny thing about this thing, Boat, it's something, this is something that's changed a lot. Uh, and, well, not entirely, but people, I was reading a lot of posts about this, and people, they built the computer, and they're like, you know, I'm going to build myself a sound card, or I'm going to build myself a graphics card. I'm going to add more memory to it. And so this was... This was like a hacker's unit. People were just going crazy adding stuff to it. And one thing I will say before we close this one up, this thing had a full proper keyboard that came with it. So I mean, this was a this was a system you could actually type on and, right. and do something with. So it was a it was a real fascinating story. That's one of our, one of my favorite episodes we've done for a long time. I enjoyed NASCOM. it too. I particularly enjoyed the story of uh, you know the the group of NASCOM users converging on the one guy's computer that didn't work, and they were all gathered around it trying to troubleshoot it and all that stuff. That's great. I love stories like that. You know that reminds me of going to the old user group meetings back in the day, and this is sort of what I envisioned for the ICC. Uh, it's just like when you have a problem, people would come together. Computer people are. They're they're good people generally, you know, especially back in those days because it was a it was your smarter people that were getting together trying to help each other out, and they looked at it almost like a pro, like a problem to solve, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, a lot of fun on that one. Um, we finally we put out the last of the Ask the Amigos shows. I actually listened to some of this one and uh, went listen back back to it again. I enjoyed it. I enjoy I always enjoy these. It's funny because I listen to them again. And I have no idea what I'm going to say, and I'm the one that said it. So I don't <laughs> know what that means about me. But if you're into that, uh, check it out. And then I want to touch on this. Uh, Sprite Castle Place, Tron Cycle Clones. Our boy Rob Flock O'Hare, who's with us in the chat right now, uh, jumped on and played a bunch of crazy, a bunch of crazy C64 uh, Tron clone, Tron Cycle Clones, which is funny because one of the games me and Brent played on the NASCON episode was, guess what, a, a Tron Cycle Clone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, it was right in my wheelhouse. And this led up to his uh, uh, You Don't Know Flack, which I believe came out today or yesterday, which was on Tron. You know, it's funny so. because I, I watched this, and one of the Tron games that he plays has the, your ringtone as the as the background. What is it? Blue Thunder? What's the, oh, what's about Airwolf? Airwolf, yeah. Like, he fires up the game and it had... Down, down. I thought Granny was calling. It it's was amazing. Because, you know where I got that ringtone? No. Rob Flacco here. <laughs> he put up a bunch... <laughs> He put up a bunch of ringtones one time, and I picked out the Airwolf one, which I've had for, gosh, a couple of years now, well, as soon as I got the phone. And so that's where I got it. So Flack actually put up a bunch of those. Wow. Uh, but yeah, Circle yeah, Traverse. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, before we move out of the YouTube stuff, why don't you talk to the people about what you, you and Neil got up to this week? So this week on This Week in Retro, we had uh, four big stories in the world of uh, of gaming. And uh, we talked about Pac-Man Geo, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, this, is, right this is a, uh, this is a, it's like Pokemon Go, except you're Pac-Man and you're running around collecting dots, running through traffic, you know, dodging. That's the ghosts is the traffic. Yeah. Um, and Surely not. No, no. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of what I think is going to be the reward for people for getting through COVID is that you can gather around with your buddies, stare blindly into your phone and wander around public spaces once again, once we're, once we're done with the long national, international nightmare. That uh, never gets old watching that. <laughs> we, we also talked about a, a village, uh, in England or no, a village in Wales who, uh, there was an elderly couple that had a CRT that brought down the whole village's uh, broadband network when they turned it on every morning at 7 a.m. I'm sure yeah. you've been there. I heard about this. It's funny. This story made all the geek areas you would expect, you know. And the funny thing is, I remember hearing about this a long time ago. You know, America had real stringent requirements for on, on shielding. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, I mean, and it affected everybody. It, it made costs go up. You you hear about it all the time. When you open these old machines, I mean, there's a big, thick metal shield on all of them. Yeah. You know? I'm assuming that the UK wasn't quite as stringent on that. Uh, 
Uh, it's hard. So, it's hard. It's hard to know what exactly you could put inside a TV that would take down an entire village. You know what? What sort of homemade device this was that was cobbled together in the backwoods of Wales? Well, um, I'm assuming it's an ancient. It was probably one of those big old school tube TVs. Yeah. That put out a ton of weird interference. You know, Neil was talking about having his microwave scrub his Wi-Fi. That happens here too. So even today, you get weirdness that that comes out of these. You know, this stuff that sends out these crazy signals everywhere. But I wasn't terribly surprised by that. I, I was amused. I think that couple ended up coming forth because mm. uh, it seems like I saw a picture of them the other day, but I, that was a great story. I got a big kick out of that. We also talked about Mist, Aaron. This has been a big <laughs> yes. year for Mist, and they're bringing it back again. <laughs> <laughs> I was stunned to hear this. <laughs> this time I, it's going to be, you know, I ordered the Oculus Quest 2 yep. just in time to Isn't play it? Mist in virtual reality. And you're going to buy this, are you? This new Mist? I probably will. You know, why you know, not? You know, our, our buddy John Charleston John is the is a huge mist fan. Is he really? I think it's a uh, John. I think it's John. And also, our buddy, my buddy Sean's a big mist guy too. Here's the thing. I, I it's funny. Me and Brick covered mist on our a doll, on our Windows ninety five episode of ARG a couple months ago, and um, one of us picked mist. Uh, you don't think about mist being a Windows ninety five, uh, and I think it was also a DOS. So it was released on both. And the Amiga. I mean, when you when you play mist, I remember for years mist was the poster boy for a non-game like for me like i'd see that i'd be like oh geez here we go what's one of those did mist actually come out on the amiga uh there is a uh one of the rtg i think versions that came out in the amiga uh but uh uh, you know this game this is a sort of a non-game for me but i mean it's funny when i went back to play it for the show it does have a, a very cool vibe and when I was researching it, it turns out that the people that made it were like super artists, like big time. And, you know, that so duh, that's why it's very unique, you know, right, right. and no one can fault the art and stuff on it. Uh, but and also, the, I will say the fact that there's a that they're going to do this in virtual reality. It's interesting, you know, to me, that might be kind of neat, you know. I'm so. I'm looking forward to, you know, stumbling around. I'm going to take this thing. You've seen my backyard, Aaron. It's not it's not a small area, okay? Mm-mm. I'm going to take this quest out there and I'm going to wander around the whole thing until I stumble out into the road and get hit by a car. It's going to be when great. You start suing them. I'm excited. Um so we talked about that and then finally we wrap things up with, you know, I have a feeling we're going to see lots of these copycat documentaries uh, surface. Netflix had a high score their retro gaming documentary, so CBS yeah. All Access is coming out with something called The Console Wars. That is going to be their take on sort of video game history. What what do you think about that, Aaron? Well, this this story's a lot like the Mist. You know, what are we doing here? Well, people that were younger, they played Mist and they played uh, the, and they were involved in the console wars, and that that that's what they wanted to see shows about. Just like I, you know, hey, when when I, when I was when I was you know in my your early twenties or whatever, and and into the thirties, and they're like that, you know. The big thing was the video game crash or, or the buried ET cartridges. Well, we've moved past that. Now we're into the console wars. You know, we're moving into that phase of stuff that people grew up with. Will it be good? I don't know. I mean, probably. Really, I thought high score. I've only watched one episode of it. I don't know how many of them are there, five. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. In fact, I really enjoyed it more than I think anybody just because I hadn't heard some of the stories in it, you know. I mean, you, when you walk into these things and you are heavily interested in this genre, you're going to know a lot of that stuff. But the little minutia is what I found interesting. And so hopefully this will be something like that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and I will say I don't know much, as much about the console wars as I do you know, other stuff. So that might be kind of fun. Um, so if you want to listen to uh, me and Retro Man Cave uh, spin on, on all that stuff, uh, check out This Week in Retro. It's time for the news, Aaron. Bring out, bring out the robot. Bring out the gamble train. Every time I see this, I'm sure I've mentioned it. it reminds me of that episode of The Simpsons where the guy jumps. Oh, where the guy jumps and takes the bullet for uh, uh, Agnew. You ever seen that? No. He goes no. And also the bodyguard bit where the guy jumps in front of. Them. That's what the robot looks like. He's like he's taking a bullet. As he, he is. By. He's taking a bullet for the Amiga. <laughs> All right, Aaron. The first story we've got is something from your buddy. You hear from him all the time. You're practically brothers. Edu, yes. a.k.a. Aaron oh, yes. and Annette. Yes. He's got a new thing out, and this thing is the ultimate CDTV video board, plus SD, 
plus Wi-Fi. It does it all because the CDTV did nothing. So <laughs> this thing is, uh, it's again, in the grand tradition of all of EDU's uh, products, is quite cheap, extremely cheap by Amiga yeah. standards. And this thing, this board replaces the original CDTV video board, and it improves the video out, uh, quality. It completely removes the vertical bars made on some monitors, and it also includes a video amplifier. So this thing is like uh, the ultimate video upgrade for your CDTV. Plus, it gives you an SD card. Plus, it gives you Wi-Fi. Um, and he even links to a small back cover for the board so it can look all nice in your system. He links to the Thingverse there. So uh, if you are a CDTV fan, and I'm sure that there are a couple of you listening to this Amiga podcast, uh, check it out, because uh, I think this is the way to go. This is the way forward for your CDTV. What did you say the cost was on that? 32 bus? euros. So you got to buy that. Now, here's the thing with... I'm thinking Ed, about Ed, buying it. I do. First of all, a CDTV is the most beautiful of all the Amigas, mm. uh, by far. Mm. This thing is a gorgeous piece of kit. It looks like it sits, it sits right there with all your VCRs and your CD players. It's your... It looks like something. It's very much like the old uh, 3DO. You know, I'm, I'm looking at better. a uh, looking at a picture here in the uh, crappy yeah. games wiki, and yeah, yeah. Uh, that beauty. that is it does look nice. It, I, I would I would put that in my entertainment center. Oh yeah, hell yeah, and it's an Amiga 500 stuck in there basically. This so, was the what, controller they should have released with the Amiga 500. Why well, did they not release a D-pad with two buttons for the 500? Well, uh, listen, this what are you gonna do? But this thing, there's not a ton of these things floating around. I've never seen you know? one. I believe this. Doesn't Ravi have one of these? Edvin, I, I know Edvin's got Edvin. one. And so you've got. That's right. We saw it on his on his tour. Uh, but uh, uh, these are awesome little units, except for they're not. Right. Okay. So the thing that Edu is doing a, a a service to the community on this one. You know, we were talking about him earlier uh, uh, this week with some guys. Edu puts out good stuff. And I mean, obviously, I'm sitting here looking at one of his uh, products, and he and he and he doesn't screw you on the price. He really doesn't. Uh, you know, he's he really gives you a lot of bang for your buck. And while we're talking about him, just for the people that care, uh, if you already have an Unamiga and ordered the extra header with the extra, so you can play C64 and uh, the next and the MSX, he said this week in an email that he'll be shipping those or start shipping those next week plus boat. If you ordered the next wave of Unamigas, I, I have been told that those are going to start shipping next week as well. Wow. So uh, what I guess what that means is if you're in, still in the market for an Unamiga and you didn't get in on the last batch, chances are that the, the, the he'll be putting up another batch for sale sometime in the next couple weeks. So you might want to keep your eye peeled, my yeah, friend. Yeah, that sounds good, man. Um, our next story is uh, speaking of FPGAs. There's a new one in town, Aaron. Mm. This one is called the Mystica FPGA 16. And okay. here's the newest one. The CD, S-I-D-I, an FPGA Amiga clone. Okay. This is this is an interview that is put up on Obligement. And, uh, of course, the, the great French Amiga yeah. site. Wow, I hadn't been there for a while. Yeah, Obligement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, this is uh, 99 euros, Aaron. 99 euros. That's a, that's a good price. If you so got girl talking, problems, you're setting it. You're so you're right about the same area there as the as the Unamiga. You're thing. you're securely under the area of the Unamiga. Well, this I mean, guy is undercutting sh- edge you, and he's getting away with it. Stuff. It's gonna you know. It's Here's the problem. Here's picture. the problem, Aaron. Yes, this sir. thing has no DB9 port, no DB9 ports, and and uh, and no HDMI output. Can you explain what this is? Because of course the Unamiga has no HDMI either. What what does this do exactly, Bo? It's you know you got your it's it's an FPGA core uh-huh. that that runs Amiga games. So you got your USB ports. I mean it's like the Mister. It's like everything else. So it, but this doesn't hook into an Amiga or anything like that. Oh Amiga. no no no! It's not a header. This is a standalone unit. So if you don't so have you- a five hundred laying around. And you yeah. want something that you can just, you know, it's basically like a cheaper standalone vampire or a cheaper uh, mister, uh, then then this will be like a standalone situation for you. So this this would probably run on the exact same core that the Amiga does. Oh, yeah. FDM. I'm sure it's the same Listen, core. This, for, what did you say, 99 euros? Um, hey, that's, and I'm assuming it's got the SD card slot. And the mm-hmm. usual. That whole shebang, yeah. You know, I, I you know, of course, I love my, mine. I love it. If you've got, uh, if you just want to get something to fool with that's cheap, and you want to, an, an easy way to do Amiga, 
you could do worse. I mean, there's the argument that well, you could just emulate it with a Raspberry Pi, and you could. You know, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Uh, but all I know is I I emulated the Amiga on the Raspberry Pi, and I've I've got the FPGA version. I like it better. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. That's 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 what it all comes down to. Not bad, you know, not bad. Yeah. So keep Good an eye that. on this. This is something that I haven't seen covered on any other Amiga site. Like I haven't seen this on on Indie Retro News or anywhere else. I feel like we, we might be breaking this story is, in the English speaking world, Aaron. Is this is this is coming out of France? This folks? is this is straight out of France. Now are they? Is this shipping now? Yeah, yeah, you can go and you can order. Well, I don't know if it's shipping now, but you can order it now. Uh, you can go to his website and you can place an order with this thing. I'd be interested to, uh, if anyone picks one of these up, drop us a line because I'd be interested to see how this thing goes. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, you know this. You know we talk about how everything's so expensive, right? And what you're getting here, assuming it's the same thing I've got on the Amiga, you're effectively getting a accelerated Amiga 1200 with AGA uh, simulated with an FPGA and and it runs virtually everything. You yeah. Know? And so if you want something that's, if you basically want something that'll run everything that you can just hook up, what is the output on this mode? Is it VGA? Oh, uh, let's take a quick look real quick Since here. It wasn't HDMI. Oh, uh, yeah. VG, VGA yeah. out. And also RGB a- out, Aaron. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's not bad. That's see, that's something I don't have. On this mine. is a very attractive looking unit. I know that it's yeah. it's hard for you to see on uh, because of the way that we're doing the video. But does, it uh, come with a, does it does that case come with it, boat? Uh, the case comes with it. The case okay. comes with it. So very good. Um, and uh, there is uh, this guy actually sells a whole variety of of products. You have uh, he he sells his own take on the Mister. Uh, you know, if you want an all in one solution for the Mister, and it seems reasonable, two hundred thirty five bucks all out the door, including a case. I mean that that seems like a pretty good deal. He also sells his own OSSC that's manufactured in the EU. In case you're skittish about buying one straight out of China, so uh, check this guy. This is m a n u f e r h i dot com. This is, I believe, he's he lives in Spain. Aaron, good find, boat. Well done. Yeah, yeah. So that's where Edu lives, by the way. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe they're buddies. You never know. Maybe they're competitors. You never know. Now the FPGA news keeps coming, as you so adroitly mentioned on um, on the Discord. Now is not the time to argue about Xbox versus PC. Those wars are over. It's time to start arguing about the validity of FPGA versus emulation. That's where the real wars are. That's where the stakes are highest. <laughs> That's where the stakes are dumbest. <laughs> so this is the Mini Mig RTG for the mist. The so this is the new core for the uh for the for the mist so i know that rob has a mist this is not the mister this is the original mist this yeah. has been updated to work on that and so i'm glad oh, to good. see that amiga development still continues on these earlier fpga models um this is available for free but this guy has a um he has a uh, a patreon page also that you can contribute to and this is over at retro ramblings.net uh, and now you this- can Mm-hmm. This brings it up to the to the same core that they've got on the Mister. Is that what you're saying? I I, I, I do not know that that is the truth or not, but I want to say yes, probably, maybe. I mean, that's great. Uh, you're right. It's nice to see these uh, that 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 the old version is still getting some love. Definitely give this dude a couple bucks. I mean, it's worth it. I think. Cool, cool. All right, Aaron. Next up, this video comes to us from Pixel Vixen, uh, our friend over in Japan. Oh, yeah. Uh, she has put together a great video that runs down all of the new arcade uh, ports to the Amiga as of right now. So she goes through and talks about uh, Missile Command, Tiny Galaga, Dodgy Rocks, Bomb Jack Beer Edition, and Tiny Bobble. I'll tell you, Aaron, this has been a great year for quality arcade ports you know i think tiny galaga is a whole lot of fun of course you know tiny bubble bobble we talked about dodgy rocks was a release that we just talked about last week i haven't had a chance to play the beer edition of bomb jack but uh i'm sure that it's also excellent so uh pixel vixen uh if you are not subscribed to her channel definitely subscribe to her channel look at her art uh it's it's all fantastic and uh we wish her the best over there in the land of the rising fun She's got some uh, specialized, uh, self-drawn merch as well. Because mm-hmm. she's an artist, as you, you, yeah. you know that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and finally, speaking of art, Aaron, 
Uh, the deadline is fast approaching by the 10 minute Amiga Retrocast Presents Amiga Art Contest 2020. This is the second annual art contest sponsored by Pixel Vixen and 10 minute Amiga Retrocast. Uh, and you can put in, you can submit your entries right now, uh, anytime before October 11th. So get those art entries in. I can't wait to see all of the quality art that it will be submitted. And again, if you submitting something for Amigathon this past year, uh, Doug has uh, welcomed you to resubmit that same piece of art to the art contest. Absolutely. This should be interesting. Uh, cause I mean, I gotta say the, uh, the Amigathon, the art contest, I was, <laughs> Wow, I was stunned at how great it was. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure Doug will get. So he's been announcing this for a while. There should be some even more uh, numerous arts, you know, awesome art in, that is going to be involved in this one. Yeah, you can email any artwork or music to art at amigaartwork.com. Very good. All right, Aaron, that's going to do it for this week's news. Let's go ahead and jump right into this week's game, Lords of Chaos. Lords of Chaos. I love I love the name of that boat. I'll be honest with you. You know, you know, I'm a big fan of the name. So, Lords of Chaos. I've been kind of, I'd forgotten about this uh, title in the Amiga. So when this popped up, my I, my ears perked up, and I'll get into why. So, uh, this came out. Now, this was a game that was originally released on the 8-bit computers, uh, specifically the ZX Spectrum. Uh, this got a real late release boat uh, on the on the 8-bits in in April of 1990. Mm. Uh, which is, <laughs> I wonder what kind of numbers they they sold on those. Well, I mean, you know, you, you got to remember, using? 1990 in England was like 1985 in the U.S. in terms of like computer adoption. So there were still tons of Spectrum owners out there. There were still tons of 8-bit users doing getting it done in 90 oh, over there. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, this was released uh, on the Amiga and the other 60-bit systems uh, in 91, which we'll go into where it got released. Uh, came on a disc. Uh, this was uh, published by an outfit called the, the Blade, and it was put together. And it was also developed by an outfit called Chrysalis. Now we've seen them uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a few times. Uh, this game uh, was designed by a fellow named Julian Gollop. Uh, we know if him. You've heard, if you've heard of that guy, uh, you would you would recognize a lot of his titles. Uh, in fact, we hear about these over and over, don't we? Both yeah. Laser Squad. It's a game I've. We've never played this, but I've heard about it like a million times. Uh, you, he did UFO or XCOM if you're in the states. He also did uh, one. Uh, he did Chaos uh, on the uh, Spectrum, and he also did Chaos Reborn, which I'll talk about more on Steam. Uh, so he was he was a big player, and he developed this game. And this game was, of course, was ported over to the Amiga. And from what I read, it was a direct port of the Atari ST version, except with some better music. Mm. So if you're which Looking is funny because there isn't what there isn't much music in this game. Well, they, yeah, but they've got more of the Atari did. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, uh, this game uh, was coded by a guy named Martin Beadle, and the uh, graphics were done by a guy named Mark Harop, who also worked on Laser Squad. And the music on this guy on this bad boy was done by Matt uh, Furness, who's done tons of games that we even covered tons of his games, but he did Arabian Nights, Chase HQ, Clax, he did Laser Squads, Tubin, bunch of stuff. So you had a, a, people that generally knew what was going on. Um, this got a release, a wider release than I would have anticipated, Bo. It's funny because we, we covered this on R. Sinclair, I don't know, a couple years ago. I don't know if I paid much attention to where this thing got ported, but this thing was st got stuck everywhere. It was on the Amstrad, like I mentioned, the Atari SE. There was a C64 release of this uh, as well. Of course, it came out in the Sinclair. There was the Timex release. So when you go, when the Timex TC2848 gets some action, you know you're doing some porting right That's there. That's right. <laughs> so what is Lords of Chaos? It's a sequel to a great game called Chaos on the ZX Spectrum, other machines. Uh, a game where you are basically, I think it was like, was it six or eight wizards are pitted against each other and effectively a magical battle royale. Uh, all on one screen, uh, you would just take turns. It was turn-based combat where you played a wizard who would whip up monsters to and, and spells to a, to a vanquish the other wizards. Uh, this was a game that when we picked this, when this came up on uh, R. Sinclair, I was sweating it. This is one of those. And it took me about three days to figure out what I was doing. And then I've loved it ever since. It's, it's probably my favorite game on the, on the Specky. Uh, just love it. 
and the boy loves it too. Me and him play it all the time. Uh, and so uh, I assume that uh, uh, Julian looked at that game and, and thought to himself, how can we evolve this great game into something that's a little more in-depth? And the result of that thought was Lord of Chaos. So Lords of Chaos takes that same basic formula uh, with the Wizards, but it kind of mixes it up into a, uh, I, I guess, sort of map-based, turn-based exploration RPG. But, I mean, some of this is sort of skin deep, isn't it, Bo? The, uh, uh, calling this an RPG would is probably not realistic. It's more of just a map-based version of Lords of Chaos with some additional stuff mixed in. The story... The background story on this boat is 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 pretty interesting. They actually spent some time on it. So, in the world where these wizards live, uh, everything was cool, and then suddenly uh, there started becoming a surplus of mana. Mana is the magic, the power that the power that powers magic. Yeah, it is. And and yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Being a warlock and all. So eventually, so what happens? You get too much mana, and so. Uh, the mana starts causing strange magical things to happen. Monsters are appearing. Swamps are appearing. <laughs> I uh, hate when mana makes swamps appear. Listen, <laughs> clearly there was a lot of mana up in Jersey. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, so all this bad stuff's happening. So the people, the non-magically inclined people of this world were like, well, these wizards are screwing us again. And so they went to war against the wizards, you know, because that's all they, they were ignorant. They didn't have any magic and what was going on. The wizards knew what was going on. And they tried to keep they tried to figure out what was happening. But unfortunately, the man had built up so much and they were distracted by these wars that the planet started having earthquakes. And eventually the planet split apart. Okay. And and basically when this happened, according to the manual, the fragments of this were basically became their own lands. Yeah, there's okay? not not much thought to like how gravity and and things like that work. I'm not sure if that it's would magic, be what would happen. Yeah, maybe it's yeah. You're right. It's magic. Yeah. And, and so the, these wizards now, the all the normal people were dead. They were done. And so the world, uh, so the world was gone. You had all these little like fragmented planets. Basically, mm -hmm. it's like areas. Bastion. If you've ever played yeah. Bastion, it could be. And so. The wizards were like, well, the man is still here. Uh, we think we know what it is. That what they decided on, there was that they decided that a portal had opened up and this man was coming into the portal. And so what do you do when all the normal people are dead, the, the whole world's shattered, and you've got unlimited magic? You go and fight the other wizards. That's in a big, right. <laughs> in a big, another big wizard battle royale. And so that's basically where the story picks off. And eventually, ultimately, you're trying to uh, get out the portal and basically get rid of all the other wizards. Um, this game supports up to four players. You can have computer players or human players. I like that right out of the gate, both. And uh, this is a uh, chaos was so much more fun with other humans that uh, this would this is another game I suspect would be a lot more fun with multiple humans as opposed to playing with a bunch of computer uh, generated players. Um so in this game, let's talk about the opening menu. I'm, we got to talk about this right out of the gate, Boat, because I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, much much like the Spectrum version, this this opening menu is dumb because it makes you you have to affect you have to have the manual to even know what to load in this game mm -hmm. because you have to load the one of the first three scenarios and you have to go to load scenario and then type in the number 1 and hit the button or type in the number 2. Yeah. Now they this did that this sort of thing this sort of thing was acceptable in the days of the Spectrum. But yeah. by the time that you're on the Amiga, you got to move forward past that. That that's exactly correct. That's exactly what I want to hear from you, Boat. This was dumb. I didn't like this on the Spectrum and I and I hated it on the Amiga. Mm -hmm. What what on earth were they thinking there? That could they not come up with a more Something like, more, a little more elaborate. Push one through six to load the scenario. That's you know, all you'd have to do. The menu on this is virtually the same as it mm -hmm. was on the Spectrum in terms. I mean, you can use the mouse, but I mean, it's still goofy. The, there's a uh, buttons to start the game. There's buttons to uh, design your wizard. Uh, there's you know, and there's, and there's also a scenario editor and some other stuff in this. But I mean, it's just it's the opening menu is clunky, uh, which is not a good sign for a game filled with menus. <laughs> so, well, I, yeah, I think I think if I was going to subtitle this game, it would just be clunk. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. Uh, but so 
once you you can you can start off by making a wizard. Now this is one of the departures from the original chaos, where you could just in the original you could name your wizard. You sort of picked an icon for him. Uh, in this one, you actually uh, are taking a wizard up level by level. Mm-hmm. And so you can uh, you name your guy, and you sort of you have points you could divvy up. Uh, but between mana and stamina. And yeah, I mean, some- I, you know, when you said that the role-playing elements in this game were sort of skin deep, I disagree with you. I think that there's tons of role-playing elements in, in this game. Okay. Yeah, like, I, I mean, like, any time that you start with a character and you're assigning points, I mean, that's that's well, that's much more role-playing than a lot of quote-unquote role-playing games are. Let me, let, me back, let me back up what I said with this, because uh, you're right. I don't necessarily consider that role. I, when I think role playing, I think like a uh, uh, a narrative, like a. Uh, a, 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 a I mean, this has uh, this has what's in the book, but I mean, I think like uh, character interaction, you know, stuff like that, which this game doesn't really have. Uh, uh, you're right. How much character is, interaction is in Wizardry? Well, it's been a while since I played Wizardry. None. I'll, be I'll tell you. <laughs> So, but I mean, something like, oh, let's just, just right off the top of my head, let's say like an Ultima. Uh, you're talking to people, uh, you're you're meeting people, you're going places, you're obtaining information. In this game, you're doing none of these things. Uh, so, in, in my mind, that means it's not really a role-play game. It's a stat game, I'll give you that. But it, I wouldn't call it a role-play game personally. But I mean, that's, we're arguing It's over- a stat game? Yeah, that's that's definitely a genre that people use all the time. Well, you I'm I'm not saying you're wrong. It's just I, obviously we have two different definitions of what an RPG uh, game is. Um, nevertheless, once you if you make your wish and you assign these points, uh, and when you level up enough, you can pick uh, certain spells. One of the differences in is in the original chaos. Let me ask uh, you a you, question. Hold on a second. Oh, yeah. I'm not done talking about this. Okay, you're not gonna let it go, are you, Bo? Is Mech Warrior a role playing game? Mech Warrior, the Mech, which one? The first. I'm one? talking about the tabletop game. Not the way we play it. We we it can be, but we don't use it. Well, that, that's what I mean because this to me is a tabletop game in video game form, like Mech Warrior. So yeah, if, oh yeah. I'd it, say you're, it, I, so yeah. if you don't consider that to be a role playing game, then yeah, 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 I'm with you then. I mean, there are, you, there you can play BattleTech as a role playing game, with like because the, it's got a fleshed out backstory with the clans and stuff. But we never we would just get together, pick out a, a bunch of mechs and just fight. That's all. We, and so that's that's which is this is sort of what that is. So yes, we agree on that. I'm I'm happy to hear that. So, um, anyways, before we move on to the meat of the game, boat, give me your thoughts. I mean, we know you didn't like the menus, but give me your thoughts on the on the uh, the the look of the game. Uh, the sound of the game and the and the uh, making your wizard part, all that stuff. What did you think about all this stuff? I thought it was okay. I mean, I think this game looks fine. It looks like a 16-bit game. You know, the, the visuals aren't stunning, but the visuals are perfectly serviceable, and they look better than 8-bit graphics. They certainly look better than the graphics on the Spectrum, but this is a different type of game. Um, yeah. This is a game where you have all different types of terrain that you're working with, and um, and it looks it looks fine, you know. I think that it looks just as good as that Ultima game. In fact, it probably looks a little better than the Ultima game that, that we the talked Ultima about. Game was disappointing. Yeah, yeah um, I agree. So yeah, I, I I have no problem with the graphics on this game. Uh, I do have a problem. I, I would have liked to have had some background music as you were playing. That would have been nice. Um, but uh, the 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 sound is you know bleeps and bloops. It's nothing to write home about. Um, but the uh, the graphics are fine, yeah. The graphics on this remind me, if you look at the old Spectrum version we played, it's if you got rid of Color Clash and had more colors and and, and could make them slightly bigger, that's what this looks like. I mean, they, they did not reinvent the wheel, but it, it is passable. You know, in a game like this, you don't necessarily have to have, you're not going to have, like, cutting-edge graphics or something like this. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, so the game itself. Uh, you start out in the room, and you're with, and you're the wizard, and you, then it's time to figure out what you're going to do. Now, unlike the Spectrum version, uh, this is all mouse driven. This is a good thing because one of the problems we had with the Spectrum version was the was the difficulty in controlling going through the menus. Because while this does have the same amount of menus that the Spectrum version had, th- it's so much easier to go through them with a mouse uh, than it was with the uh, keyboard. I'm not saying it's going to make you happy but it's easier 
uh, getting around is is easier. Everything about the game has been made easier because of the addition of the mouse. So the mouse is a pretty big factor for me uh, in terms of the control. Um, when you, so what can you do? Well, as a wizard, you can when you when you play this, you'll understand that there's a cadence to how the turns go. Uh, you can you can move your character can move or he can cast and there are limits to both well you, you yeah certain- we, okay let, let me just stop you go ahead okay this is just like ufo you've got a certain number of action points that you can use that's right okay you've got movement points you've got casting points and you, you can do things until you're out of things Right. And so the you actually have a lot of freedom in this game to to do multiple things on a turn. This isn't just like um and you see you get a much better like I remember playing Chaos and and it's been a while. So forgive me if this is wrong, but I always feel like I never knew exactly how many points I had left cuz you do have movement points I think in the original Chaos. This you've got yes, bars right. on the sides of the screen, and it's really easy to tell how much you've got left of everything. Um, yes. The uh, when you when you you can either in this is where the game falls apart for me is that you have way too many options of what to do. I believe in this game, uh, you can cast things onto the ground, you can cast things into the air, you know, you can um, you you can move, you can. Uh, I'm trying to in. Each one of the the options that you have has a little icon. Now, yeah. here's where the game succeeds. Okay, you have tool tips in this game. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was I was so happy. I was yes. like, thank you, 1991, doing what most Amiga games couldn't do in 1994. I'm looking at you, settlers, useless. So this game is great because of that. But the problem is, is I just think that there are just too many options. There just needs to be like maybe like four or five. And, and you've got a row, you've got like a bank of 16 things you can do on your turn. And as a player, that that was too much for me. Now, once you get into your more advanced Lords of Chaosing, then I, I'm sure that that's okay. But um, now, on the other side, this is a game where you can really choose what you want to do right off the bat. You have so much more freedom in this game than you do in the original Chaos because Chaos 1 is like chess. It's like a knife fight in an elevator, okay? You're in a really, really small space, and you pretty much have no no choice but to start attacking your opponent almost immediately. I mean, you can do things like make the tree spell and junk like that. It reminded me of like a turn-based out, uh, turn-based version of Archon, basically. Yeah, right? yeah, that's that was exactly the right. Part stripped out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this game, it's definitely more like a tabletop uh, strategy game where you're casting creatures, you can send your creatures out to go and do things. They can Your creatures can collect items for you and do things like that. You're exploring this world because you have fog of war. And um, it's funny because <laughs> the manual, um, you know, obviously this is probably one of the first games to use fog of war. And they're like, it uses an incredibly complex system called fog of war. But so you can only see what you're supposed to see. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, so right off the bat, you have tr- a tremendous amount of strategy. Like, do you want to go straight for the other wizard? You know, do you want to find him and try and kill him? Or do you want to hang back, collect things that can make you stronger, collect keys, open doors, find items, uh, you know, do stuff like that. Now, I read this whole manual and I felt like it didn't tell me half of the things that you could do in this game. Like, right. uh, like it basically takes you through the first scenario and then it's like, you're on your own. Good luck. And which is fine because the people that played this game are going to devote a significant amount of time to it. But, um, I read some stories about what people had done in this game and it just, it made me feel really excited about the possibilities, you know, like people talking about how they hid their creatures in bushes and then they, the, the, the creature would spring forth at a wizard as he would pass by and stuff like that because of the fog of war. Um, you know, being able to play this with multiple people and having this huge map to explore and things to find and, and levels to gain and things like that. Like, again, to me, this is like the the closest adaptation. You know, forget about that Escape from Colditz. That was an incredibly poor adaptation of a board game. This is an incredibly great adaptation of a tabletop game that never existed, but probably should have. This game would be a great modern 
online multiplayer game where you could where where everyone had their own fog of war, and it would allow that uh, some real interesting situations to come up. I, mm-hmm. I've read some stuff too, same probably the same place you read them. One of the things I mean, this game does give you uh, one of the reasons you've got so many icons is because there's so many weird things you can do, and a lot of these I'm looking at the icons right now. And a lot of these are super situational, right? Right. right. Like for example, you mentioned cast on the ground, cast in the air. That means you can just cast flying stuff or cast spells of people in the air because there's aerial combat. You can throw stuff on the ground in the air. There's even buttons for stuff like mount and unmount horse or, or land. And it's funny because the original Chaos had the same thing, but it was just handled in a different way. Mm-hmm. What they tried to do here was they took everything off the keyboard, so it's completely mouse driven. And I appreciate that. I mean, yes. You look at this bank of buttons, and you're like, holy smokes, look at all this crap. But in all honesty, it's not very often you're going to hit the drink from the vial or land button or the get or dismount. These are real super situational buttons. Yeah, I just wish that they would have made it. They should have made a a couple of those just more contextual, like click on your guy, and then when you click on, like, and then make certain buttons appear at certain times instead of giving you everything all the time. Well, that's that's true. They could have done that. They did not. And one thing you're going to find out in this game is is uh, you're clicking with both buttons because you basically your left button is select whatever your target is, and your right button really does a ton in this because mm-hmm. you're it basically shifts through multiple banks of menu options. Right, right, and like, that's my other problem that I have with this game is that they should have found a way to include your um, your your vitals on the same screen as the screen with the buttons and they should have just put the in turn buttons on the same screen too like the, i don't know like i said i i feel like they could have contextualized the buttons to where maybe you have maybe eight buttons instead of 12 buttons and then maybe may, instead of having uh, gauges maybe using text or something like that to show the the, the your stats and then that third screen like when you're playing a turn-based game, you're taking a lot of turns, and th- I mean it's literally like a four-click thing just to get to the screen to end your turn. It's way you're too right. much clicking around. Here's here, I, I thought about this quite a bit this week, Boat, because I had a fun with getting this discussion. I again, and you're right. Having those icons be situational would be that would be good. Uh, I, I, I can, but I can forgive them for it because they they would they did it in the, the best intent, so mm-hmm. I can give them a pass on that. Right clicking to get to the various things, it throws you off occasionally, which I'll get to here in a minute. But I can understand why they did that too, because you you can still select with one button while you're getting the information with the other, uh, with and you're flipping to the menu with the other button. So it actually works, because you go from you get when you click on a character the first time you right click, you get that list of buttons, the big huge list. When you right click again you get uh, like a descriptive zoom in of the square you're on. And so you can, and you can look over stuff with that. Mm-hmm. When you click again, right click again, then you can turn, you can change whoever uh, is the current hot creature. Like basically you can flip between the different characters you control that way. Uh, you can also go get a big oversized map and you can also end your turn. Right. right? So there are three basic. Now that the problem I had with this was, uh, is often because that second screen is not what I use that much. Mm-hmm. So if it was me, I would have moved this. I would have moved the uh, in turn screen to the one after the buttons. Yeah, that because that makes sense to me too. More, mm-hmm. Okay, because I kept not clicking it three times. I'd be clicking it twice, and it was just a, it, that became a hassle. Now, if you play this enough, and I did. You get used to it after a while. And well, it, yeah, it, you get used more. to it like Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, you're well, like, oh, maybe it's not so bad. But, I mean, what they're doing here, I thought the controls on this, because that they, the big issue I have with the Spectre was how complicated the controls were. These controls seem complicated, but they're not mm-hmm. to me. Yeah, I, I agree got used with you. to them. Now, here's where it, it gets difficult, because this is the nature of this game. When your wizard summons a bunch of creatures, and you can summon creatures up until you're out of mana, mm-hmm. among other things, which we'll get into... Uh, and then you can send these creatures to everywhere you want on the map. And like Boat said, they could, they don't just attack. If the creatures got hands, they could pick stuff up like a gorilla or something. They could, or, or like a pixie or whatever. They could pick stuff up uh, and, and do, you know, do interesting stuff. Um, when you've got that many creatures, it's hard to keep track of which ones you've taken their turns on, especially if you don't go in the exact order that, you know, you know what I'm saying, with next creature, mm-hmm. next creature. And so mm-hmm. that can get... On, on on the original chaos, it would tell you if you forgot to take a turn with somebody, 
uh, which I liked. On this, it doesn't seem to do that because I could, you know, I, I'm sure I missed turns. I guess is what I'm right. saying. And here's and that, the, what I would have liked. What I would have liked to have seen is like little. I'd like to see it sort of like more buttons. So I know I'm sort of being a hypocrite, but <laughs> it would be great is if it, at the bottom of the screen you could see a little square with a little icon that represent each one of the characters that you've summoned plus your wizard. Okay, I'm thinking about like this is what happens in UFO. You know, at the at the bottom of your screen, you've got all your dudes there, and they're highlighted like the ones that haven't gone yet. Like you can tell just at a glance. Yeah, that's number one. Some indicator would be nice. Right. I agree. Number two is even though this game is entirely mouse driven, give me the option to use a keyboard shortcut to cycle through my characters. That was the number one complaint that I had with this whole UI, is just cycling through your characters in between the right clicks and looking at the map and all that stuff. Like, I wanna be able to look at the map, like the big world map, which by the way is drawn very well. Yeah, and it, I, it's definitely serviceable. Yeah, and, and I wanna be able to hit W or whatever and just quickly cycle through each one of my characters to see where they are and what they're doing. Yeah, uh, um, uh, keyboard shortcuts, which I wouldn't use them, by the way. But I mean, I could see where someone that enjoys gaming like that would absolutely want those. And it would, and really, I might use them just if I could switch a lot quicker with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah. Um, aside from just sitting in your, and now, of course, the ultimate goal of these things is to go out and kill the other wizard. Now, of course, you can make creatures. You can also, there are spells you can do, which is, again, much like in the original in Chaos, you could lightning bolts and you know make and uh healing and whatnot but in this game you can also brew up potions uh, uh and stuff like that which is neat they uh, you could also pick up weapons keys there are actual stuff to pick up that will like for example if you have a, a character that will uh, uh that will give a sword will make him more powerful in combat for example or you could make people invisible you know something like that i read something where someone had uh, was playing a human opponent he'd made two of his pixies invisible, and he had them sitting in the guy's uh, cauldron room, and every time the guy whipped up a uh, potion, the pixies would come over and steal it and drink it. <laughs> you know, I, I read another it. story I about a guy it. who had, he parked four elephants so the, the his opponent couldn't get out the doors of his house, and he burnt the house down and killed him. This you know, is like, you like know, that. this is like, this is one of these games that's just like EVE Online, where I feel like listening to the stories of all the wacky things that go on in the game is so much more fun and interesting than actually playing the game. You know, I'm going to tell you, uh, Boat, when we covered this on the on Ars Sinclair, I, I was not real fond of this game because I loved Chaos so much. Right, right. You know? And I, did, I do enjoy it much more now. I, I mean, I really I think do. it's definitely better on the Amiga, no yeah, question I, about it. I played it quite a bit uh, this week, uh, on and off. I mean, again, there are some things I don't like, you know, the bar system to tell you your different, uh, you know, your, how much movement, mm -hmm. I know why it's there because those bars are going to change. And they wanted a way to show you, uh, when they decrease and increase on top of the fact that you're draining them, but still numbers would, with a, telling you what this stuff is, would be a lot easier to read for mm -hmm. me. And the, and the menu flipping could be easier. I mean, obviously, and there's a few of these, but I mean, there's a lot of craziness that goes on in this game because aside of the fact that you're fighting another wizard, I only played one on one, but you can have you think about having four people in this. There are also creatures just kind of roam around and they'll kill you too, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll kill your opponent. They don't care. Uh, uh, there's a lot more options, uh, and that makes the game interesting. I'm gonna, you know, I tried to show Luke the original. He didn't like it, but I may have, I may try to have him have a go in this because he's a big fan of chaos. Uh, because uh, this one. There's a lot going for this game. The creature, I think there's I think they read that there are like 42 spells in the game and I think 29 of them are, are different creatures. There's just a lot you, of you know, different stuff. I hate to keep interrupting you, but I keep thinking no, about please. other things that I like. I love the fact that you have your like when you open up your spell uh, book at the beginning and you yeah. have everything available to you, you know, right from the top. Well, you can't cast. Them well, yeah, but I mean, you can see everything. <laughs> it gets you excited because it's like, man, if I keep playing this game, I'm going to have access to all this stuff, and that's really yeah. cool. So, I, and yeah. I love the fact that right off the get, right off the bat, you can cast. I mean, even though you can't cast everything there, you can cast a lot. Of, so, like sometimes you just like cast, like okay, I'm going to have a gorilla and a pixie, and they're going to wander around together because I yeah. think it's funny, you know? Yeah, it's it's funny. To, you know, like, why is that elephant taking on that alligator? Right, well, it's, right. It's what's going on, and it sets up a lot of craziness now. This game, uh, the disc that comes with it, the one disc, you get three scenarios in this. 
uh, uh, you get the first scenario, the mini colored land, uh, second scenario, Slayer's Dungeon, and the third scenario, uh, Ragaril's Domain. And then they actually provide, they had an expansion pack uh, with two more scenarios, uh, uh, scenario four, Island of Iris, and scenario five, Tombs of the Undead. I think scenario five was a single player only scenario. Uh, I will say, if the company has a version of this out there, if you're into the, if you like the company's EXEs on your PC, and it has, uh, I think it's got all the expansion, I think. I have mm. to go, I, I, I'm pretty sure it does, but it plays flawlessly. I played a, uh, a little bit on my other PC, and it works well. So if you want to get a quick version of this, just on your PC, the company's got you covered. I always recommend the company's stuff. They're really good. Um, the, uh, uh, how did you fare at this boat? I guess I should ask you that. Did you have did you have good luck? I had zero success playing this game. Uh huh. I, I played the the tutorial scenario or the you know scenario one, which is the one yeah. that the book walks you through. Yeah. And then just just for fun, I played like I think scenario two, and uh, I was demolished every single time. Now, I I almost feel like at least when you're playing against the computer, that you don't have to win to have fun. Like, you know, you're roaming around, you're finding stuff, you're battling other... Because there's tons of other, like, NPC creatures in this game that are roaming about, too. It's right. not like you're just after the the Torque Monda or whatever the wizard's name is. So it's like, I sort of enjoy just, like, you know, casting a bunch of different creatures, taking my band of goons out, and just seeing what was out there. Um, like I said, where I ran into, like, frustration was just with the... Uh, was just when you have a band of goons remembering which goon has moved and which goon hasn't it, it became sort of a chore yeah. um but uh but i had fun this is a, this is one of these rare games that i had zero material success with in terms of making progress but i i did have fun with it i did pretty good i mean i could get i could get to, to the end of the first level uh the first scenario it's not that hard uh the problem i had one this game is unforgiving uh in that if you for example, there are plenty of places where you could take your wizard. And in this game, this is sort of like the new D and D's like this too. When you get within like melee range of another character, you're effectively locked on him. So, mm-hmm. for example, if your gorilla right. rolls in and there the dude's elephant's there and he gets in the next square, there's they're basically dance partners until somebody dies. Yeah, and the first and chaos so, and, is like that too. It is, and the wizard could also get caught like that. So if you're mm-hmm. trying, to, if you're going down a path and you go the wrong way. And, uh, and get joined up. Somebody. And the thing is, the wizard's a big push. Right. You, know, you, 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 you don't want to be the tank with the. Yeah. Uh, and that's yeah. happened to me a bunch of times where I'm trying to sneak the wizard around a corner and I zig when I should have zagged. And something else you got to remember, just like in Chaos, the undead can only fight each other. They can only mm-hmm. kill each other. So you don't want to walk up to someone else's zombie or a vampire with your ogre where they're going to smash them. They're, you're going to get mashed. So a lot of the stuff carried over from Chaos, which I think is really cool. But overall, I, I kind of dug this game. It's definitely, I'm definitely going to come back to it, which I won't say the same thing for the Spectrum version. And this is just one of those games. It's funny. I was listening to you and Neil talk today about uh, remaking games. And the original version of this is a prime example of that because we thought, we both thought when we covered on the Spectrum that there was a good game locked in there underneath that really bad interface. And I think this sort of vindicates that game and makes it a lot more playable than it was in the Spectrum. Now, don't get me wrong, the Spectrum game's an institution, and but those people were more used to playing games like that than we are, Boat. It was really hard for me and you to, to get into all that button smashing, but mm-hmm. a, a game that's mouse-driven, I, I, I had a lot more fun with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me personally. Uh, I do want to touch on... Uh, uh, we mentioned that uh, this was designed by Julian Gollop. He also did a game uh, that I want to talk about on Steam called Chaos Reborn. Uh, this is a real fun game. Me and the boy play it, and it's of course the same guy who designed this one. And this game sort of took, uh, this game sort of falls somewhere between Chaos and uh, and Lords of Chaos. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's very similar to the first Chaos, except there's a map that you move around on. It's not quite like this one, but it's a it's a real fun modern game that can be played online or or at home. Uh, with a lot of all the modern panache. So if you're into the Chaos series, I would really give this one a shot. I, it's also real cheap, too, Boat. It's a, it's an easy pickup for me, so I recommend that. If you don't want to try, try tack on one of these older Amiga games, give that one a shot. I think we've got some people in our uh, in our uh, 
Discord that play it as well. I think Folwoods plays it, if I'm not mistaken. It's at least one person there. But overall, Boat, I enjoyed this thing. Um, I looked at the reviews to see. I, I was interested to see how this reviewed on the Amiga. Do you have? Did you look at these reviews at all? I didn't. I don't. I have no idea. I, I would guess that this did not review well. Uh, Lemon. Now the people at Lemon, and I would say they're a pretty smart bunch. They gave us an eight point oh nine. Okay. Uh, over there, um, Amiga Action uh, in July of ninety one. Gave this a 79. Yeah, that's about uh, where I'd put it for... Amiga Joker, of course, you know them. Mm -hmm. The hammer 40. was dropped 54%. Yeah. Amiga Power was not much kinder. Uh, they reviewed this in 91 and gave it a 66. Then they reviewed it in 94 and dropped it down to a 47. Wow. Just killing this game. Uh, CU Amiga gave this a 74, and the one gave it an 82. I think these scores are all too low, to be honest with you. I think there's a good game here. Yeah, I uh, think I think that you have to put it in the right context. You have to think about it like you're playing a board game on your computer. Yeah. If you if you think about it as any other game type, then you're going to think it's garbage. And I, I will say, I, honestly, and I want to try this out sometime, Boat, I think this would be a real blast with multiplayer. I think that's probably something a lot of people have missed out on because the original Chaos... It's fun to play by yourself, but it really is a lot of fun with a bunch of players. Mm -hmm. And I think this would be very similar. So I, I would like to see this get played with multiplayer. Uh, Do we get any Discord action on this boat? We did. We got one review yes. uh, on uh, Lords of, excuse me, Lords of Chaos. Uh, this comes to us from Dave Velociraptor. Uh, he says, "I've played and loved all of Gollop's turn-based games, and this is my favorite." UFO series games are much more time consuming and you can get to a point where you're dominant, but Lords of Chaos is much harder and never allows you that comfort. To do well, you need to you need not to just defeat the enemy, but you also need to grab lots of loot and this game intentionally keeps you short of time. This means that you can keep replaying it with different tactics to improve. It's fantastic that you go into each level with nothing but your spells and within a couple turns you've got your own little army. There's more going on in this than Laser Squad, and you're not just fighting the enemy, but you're also trying to explore and find keys to unlock treasures. Sadly, while Laser Squad was turned into UFO, Lords of Chaos did not get the same expansion into a massive PC strategy game. The Amiga version also has that tracker music that the ST and others did not, a sadly overlooked classic 9 out of 10, one of wow. the very top games I've ever played. So Dave Velociraptor, huge fan of Lords of Chaos. And he and he's uh, good for you, Dave, sending in a review. This one, I can see where it'd be for, uh, foreboding for a sucker to sit down in front of this thing and say, like, well, let's, let's give this a shot. I got a week. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, my God. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was happy we'd played this before because I could bypass all the figured out what the hell. Because I, mean, I listened to our, our Sinclair episode, and the early part of that, I'm just sitting there going, like, I, don't, I didn't know what I was doing. And I was right. I had no idea. It took a while to, uh, to catch up with it. Um, you know, it's something I mentioned on that show. I want to mention it here too. The pricing on this was kind of wacky uh, when it came out because you could get the tapes uh, on this on the C64 and on the Spectrum. Uh, the tapes were uh, ten pounds, and if you wanted the Amiga or uh, uh, Atari ST version, you were looking like somewhere in the twenty-five pound range, mm, which is wow. I thought that was kind of kind of goofy uh, that the price was that different. Yeah. And I believe the disc version. Uh, on the spectrum was uh, like maybe five pounds more, something like that. So not too bad. Um, I looked this up on the eBay boat. You know, I, this is a game I'd like to pick up for the Amiga, if I'm honest, um, just because I'm such a fan. Uh, the uh, the boxed, I found the budget version had sold in the UK uh, for five bucks. The, the, that's the uh, re-release, you know, and the box isn't as cool. The non-budget version, the cool box version, 22 bucks, it went for in the UK. So and this is not a cheap game. I mean, people are still the Julian Gollop well, Halo is still around this thing. If you're good to go on the on the budget, I mean, clear right, right now there's only one available. It's a it's in Australia. It's one thing I like about the Amiga. It's like you never know where they're going to turn up with yeah. these games. <laughs> the only one available right now that as of the making of this uh, look at it was uh, an eighty eight. It was an eighty dollar package that came with two games. I don't even remember what the other game was, but I thought so. I, that's probably a little out of line. He's fishing a little bit, but the history says you're probably going to pay somewhere in, if you want the non-budget box version around 20, 25 pounds, tw excuse me, dollars. So you know whatever it is, 20, 20 pounds or so. That's worth it, I think. Yeah. The art's cool in the front too. So 
There you go. I liked it, man. I give this one uh, a surprising thumbs up. I give this a, an unsurprising thumb sideways. I hey, probably you know, won't. I won't be back with this one. You know, one thing I will say before we shut the door on this: uh, this fellow Julian Gallup, you can abs. I know we're not breaking any new ground here, but you could absolutely see the uh, evolution of his abilities uh, through these games. Chaos has uh, laid the foundation. Then you've got this. Uh, we haven't played Laser Scope. Everything we've heard about it. It sounds like a, the, the next missing link between the X, you know, until you get to the XCOM, and then when you play the game that's on Steam now, really, he as he goes, he it gets it becomes more complex, more complex. Then there's sort of a, a beginning of a little streamlining of, with complexity, and at, at the end here, he's made a game that's fairly streamlined and retains much of its complexity. So well, good for him. You know, here's the thing. I think that there are two different groups of people and there are people that like when games like Warcraft came out and you could click and select multiple units at a time and move them all at once, you know, that sort of thing um, that changed me as a game player and having to go back and select individual units one at a time and assign each of them, you know, a, a task to do or a, just a mundane movement. It's just, I don't have the patience for that. And it's entirely my fault. Like, I recognize the good game here. Uh, I recognize that it's it's a very, you know, it's it's very unique. We haven't really played anything in this setting, you know, in the sort of medieval fantasy setting like this before. I'm very surprised that this didn't go on onto the PC, given the success of uh, UFO and, and all that stuff. I would have thought that maybe Gollop would have kind of pressed for a, a new Lords of Chaos, too. Although, with the scores that this got in the magazines, maybe the uh, publisher put the kibosh on that. Well, it's funny you should mention that because a, a, a PC version of this was in the works. Really? It was never really, yeah. I, I, when I did my, I remember this in the research we did for uh, the Spectrum show. They, the, the PC had, what was supposed to have gotten, I, I believe, in fact, that, that someone has cobbled together something, as I recall. Don't hold me to that. But I know this didn't get a formal release, but there was one in the works. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, we do want to thank Hasifa, Christopher Hassel, for uh, suggesting this game to the Amigos Game Selection Committee. And yeah. uh, Aaron, it's a big week. We got a, a couple community updates here. Um, the Amigos High Score Challenge for Pipe Mania just closed. And we have a winner. Uh, the winner of the uh, Amigos High Score Challenge for Pipe Mania, Frodo NL, coming up from the bottom all the way to the top, 435,400 points. That is an unbelievable score. This was hotly contested, Bo. This I was watching. In fact, I did play this. And my score was so pitiful compared to everybody else's that I, I didn't have the guts to even talk about it. Well, yeah. I did have the guts to talk about it because I scored 4,000 points on this game. Wow. wow. So I, I was dead last. So, Aaron, never be afraid to post a score on the Amigos bad. Retro you know, Gaming this Challenge. This your game. What? I thought you liked this I game. I do like this game, but I'm just not that good at it, apparently. Um, Barkbit second, Z9K9 third. You can see the full list here if you're watching the video version of the challenge. And remember, uh, the Amigos High Score Challenge runs every month. Uh, and uh, actually, I, I can't remember if it's monthly or if it's bi-monthly. Frodo's in the chat. He can tell us because he runs this thing. And, uh, you know, our next game, Aaron, is Pinball Illusions. Oh, hold the phone. We're doing yeah. the Law Injustice. Okay, so these do run monthly because the, the this closes on the 23rd of October. Um, so, uh, if you want to get choice. in, if you want to get in on the action, uh, just join up with our discord and, uh, we, we'd love to have you, you know, we all should, go we ahead. should mention, but if you're going to play pitball illusions, this is another one that, you know, it, like if you're listening and you don't have an Amiga, you could go right to the company's website and get the ultimate pinball pack. That's got every pinball game ever released on the Amiga and play and play this and get in on this. This is a perfect one to get in on. And I, I want to make a quick uh, adjustment here. This was this is not. It's funny because I scrolled down past his name. This is not Frodo. Frodo runs our ZX Spectrum High Score Challenge. Paul, aka Hermski, runs this one. He runs this. Uh, he he is the the chairman of the uh, Amigos High Score Challenge. So sorry about nice. that, Paul. All right. So yeah. Anyway. Um, we'd love to have you join us as make us, you know, uh, as part of the, uh, the discord community. There's always cool stuff going on. All it takes is just a dollar a month. You can support the show through Patreon. If you are opposed to Patreon, 
can throw us a buck a month on PayPal. You can subscribe on monthly there. Uh, we'd love to have it, especially if you are somebody that watches the show every week, that participates in the chat, and you want to sort of take it to the next level and uh, and and see a little bit more behind the scenes and be part of the community in a deeper way. We would love to have you join us. Um, speaking of the Patreon community, Aaron, uh, we had one winner last week from our uh, our the the song challenge. Yeah. And the song challenge winner was Paul Kitching. Oh, man, uh, there were a lot of losers in that, too. Everyone that heard it. That's true. Uh, I was actually kind of surprised. I know this is outside your wheelhouse of disco and Euro techno crap, but uh, this was <clears throat> Hello by Oasis. Are you familiar that's with Oasis? What that was. Yeah, I know Oasis. Mm. I know that song. I didn't get it. Uh, so this is uh, Paul. Congratulations. And uh, we will. Uh, we actually have uh, no Patreon song this week. Uh, I'm sort of building things up because next week, Aaron, we may have a return of the Patreon band. Oh, man. This has not been publicly announced yet. I'm just saying it right here live on the show. It sounds like a public announcement. It's what it sounds like to me, folks. <laughs> but as long as the pieces come together like I think they will, then this time next week you'll be seeing the next music video release from the Patreon singers. You know how your buddy Neil released that album, right? Yeah, man. I can see it in your future. You and the, and the Patreon singers, the album, forthcoming album of all your hits. That's right. To be, to be released. <laughs> press that thing and... and uh, and get it out there, boat. So we're just going to do a uh, rundown of uh, first. Let's 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 focus on the Twitch folks, Aaron. If you support the channel through Twitch, if you give us a sub, uh, you get all the same benefits. Uh, you can join our Discord and uh, take part in all the good times. The International Computer Club. Uh, go to go sub bite links. Uh, Buck Owens is part of this. David Zenaz. Pints and Amiga, still adolescing, Frodo NL, Macintosh Librarian, Wing Chun Wolf, Great Owl G, Amiga Live, Memories of a Spectrum Gamer, Uber Scuba Diver, Pixels of Dawn Gaming, Mitsuyama Lamatsa, Chris Folds, Christian Russell, uh, Old B Sturgeon, uh, uh, Jigglebox, Retro Jerry, and Jost 80. Oh, in Amiga Live, he wanted me to sing his name in a wacky way, so I will. Amiga Live! I think he said wacky, not hideous. That was my Sinatra. Is that what that was? Yeah. Holy smokes. Where's the mob when you need him? <laughs> Put a hit out on this guy. Horrible. Now it's time for the big dogs, Aaron. The Patreon supporters. So I'm just going to read them in, uh, in reverence for the Patreon band song next week. In reverence. Holy smokes. We're going to start out with Heavy Systems, Inc. You want to bring back the funky facts, Aaron? No. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what that is, so no. No, you remember I used to tell you a name and you'd tell me a funky fact about each oh. person? Yeah, you just read the names. <laughs> I got nothing. Bundy, Frag Lord, Mark Byland, Olav Hope, Hermski. Jonah, a.k.a. Simulant, Jeremy Jones, Ethan Little, Alien Breeder, Dave Velociraptor, Cowbird Boy, Lane Denson, Luke Hudson, John Cook, Bomb the Bass, Roshi, <laughs> Frodo, oh, I'm sorry, Bomb Six the Bass. That's there we it. go. Bam. <laughs> uh, Frodo and L, Soul Incisor, Tech Mage, Jurgen, Mr. Cola, Daniel Williams, Bernard Lucas. Jerry Dennington, Zor Glub, Commodore Kid, Reflection, Simon Lech, Cap and Crispy, Kilobytes and Caffeine, Gary Heather, Free Lunch, Kate Fox, David Pickford, Cameron Armstrong, Andy Jones, Lob Sterminator, 10 Minute Amigo Retrocast, Bernard Quinn, Retro Man Cave, Tim Drew, Simon Rose, Joseph Harrison, Kyle Etter, Rob O'Hara, Matthew Laramore, Andy Craig, Sean Zoe, Bark Bit, Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie, Leif Kellond, Alan K. Bob, Chicote, Level Lord, John Marshall, Matthew Perron, Ricky DeRocher, Creepy Dead Boy, Figgy, CTZ, The Slow Norse, Stefan, Sorgard, Mortensen, Edvin Helland, Blindo75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abbott, Chris Folds, Dreamcatcher, Laurent Giroux, Graham W. Webke, Adam Battersby, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Gary Hucker, Paul Harrington, Duncan Styles, Tapes from the Crypt, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THT, 
Eric Nelson, Kim Tommy Humberstad, Daniel Bigson, Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Warns, Pixels at Dawn, and Kjolbjorn Barman. There you go. I love it. Hey, uh, Frodo just reminded us they are playing. There's still one more week to go in the big Spectrum game off. Yeah, yeah. I brought. I, I I pulled that up. You know and, what's a um, and you know what's a great game, boat. Because we played this. This is one of the first Spectrum games we ever played. Death Chase. And I picked this specifically because the name sounded cool. And this is another game. I actually have been playing this one uh, a lot. Uh, and it's this is such a cool game. You know, I, I uh, it's and it gets fast and frantic, boat. Uh, so if you want to get in on this, you got one week to go. Yeah. Uh, how? What's who's winning right now, boat? Right now, D Man is up top because oh, he's, he's the man. D-Man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We got D Man Z Nine K Nine close behind in second place, and Jigglebox in third place. So everybody's got their own strength except for me. I find myself right down at the bottom yet again in ninth I'm looking place. At your score, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put the boots to that score. I'm I'll believe it, right it when I see it. I've seen oh. your high scores before. And, All right. Uh, I'm going to get in there. Okay. I got a better chance at this one. Okay. Sounds good, man. All right, Aaron. That's going to wrap things up for this week. Next week, we are going to be playing. It's another Hermski joint in the house. We're going to be playing Ballistics, spelled cool guy style. Do you know anything about this game? I do. I believe that is a uh, 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 the same fellows that we just covered uh, last week that did awesome. Didn't I think did the Reflections do Ballistics? I, uh, okay. I think I think that's the Psygnosis joint, okay, uh, as I recall, and I actually have played this, so I actually I'm ahead of the game already, Boat. Sounds good, man. Look at that, Hermsky says I'm correct, but what about that memory on the air and right there, buddy? You've got a great memory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you sat down. You sat down and gave us the entire SuperCard rundown of both the NWA and the WCW and the WWF from 1987. Yeah, if it's stupid knowledge that doesn't help you at all, I know it. That's me. <laughs> And, of course, we would be remiss not to thank all the fine folks that join us live every week, week in, week out, Friday nights at 5 o'clock hurricane time. Very faithful. A faithful bunch, Boat. They put up with a lot of crap from us. First of all, we want to thank our mods, our mod team. They get the job done. Duncan Styles and Pixels at Dawn. Thank Good you guys dunk. so much for being yes. our, our good mods. I saw Pixels had to bring down the band hammer several times this evening. Really? He wields it with vigor. Really? Oh yeah. There was, a, there was some ban. There was ban Who gets action. Banned in our chat. Listen, man, you don't want to know the riffraff that stumbles in. Pix just throws them right back out on the street. <laughs> 3D Code Warrior was here. 48K Ram, Archfan Five, Bike Me, Bitstorm, Buck Owens, Co Brian, Commander Root, Edvin Helen, First Killer, Frodo and L, Jigglebox. Uh, Graham, NCFC, Hermsky, Eltron 5, Javasoft, Jason Warns, JDXD, Johnny Renegade, L. Curtis B, Lion Jim Video, Mitsuyama, uh, let's see, we got Mr. Cola, Olaf Hope, Picard 2010, Princess League, R. Typer, Real Joe the Zombie, Retro Gaming Denmark, Rimastino, Rob Flack O'Hara, Taishinichi, Topo Gijo, Thicker, Treyguard82, VNK, Vigoro Pros, Wishbone, and Z9K9. Thank you so much for being Big here, guys. Tonight, but yeah, hey, man. you know, before we go, you were talking about Pixels. I got I to gotta mention this, and I haven't talked to you about this in person. But I happened to tune into one of Pixels' singing streams the other day. Oh, yeah. We, he loves, I love this. Holy smokes. Where has this software been all my life? And then you got Pixels up there belting out the classics. He sang it all. We made requests. It was tremendous. Coach. I want I, you, loved it. I would like you for you to dedicate part of your stream this evening to Twitch Sings because well, Twi- I don't I don't have that installed, but I I wouldn't mind doing that. That'd be a lot of fun. It's man. going away soon. I know. I heard at the end of the year. Yeah, said, yeah. So how we, do they get rid of that? I That's know. Awesome, it's like the know? the killer app. So, but you got Pixels is in there, and he, and he does duets. Mm-hmm. You know, and he and he was on there for like hours. Right. It was like going to an actual concert. You know, it's funny because back and watched it. so many of the songs that he sings is like the first time that I've heard them or at least heard them in a really long time. And now whenever I uh, whenever I hear them on the radio, like Hall and Oates, I can't go for that. I can't yeah. hear that without hearing Pix sing it. It's in a thick, thick British accent. That's what it, that's how it comes over now. Yeah, I like it, yeah. man. I, I fully endorsed. I fully endorse these singing streams. I love that. Yeah. All right, guys, we will see you next week for another episode of Amigos. Until then. Adios. Adios.